Have you all made an announcement? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, with your permission. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. I want to kick off this morning by um, making a plea. Um, I have a lot to say today, and I'm not going to be leaving any time for questions. So if you have any, any questions, perish the thought that you should not understand everything I say, but just in case, um, please store them up for Wednesday, because uh, at least half an hour towards the end of that lecture, I will be leaving free specifically for, for questions on any subject. Now, the reason I'm entering this plea is not um, because the questions might... Uh, prove too much for me, although it, that would not be the first time that had happened, but uh, because I have been landed with rather a lot to set before you today. The administrators, God bless them, have asked me to speak about Islamic theology and about Islamic mysticism in the course of a single morning. These are, in essence, the two most important subjects that we'll be looking at. So I have my work cut out, and um, I just um, ask you to, to sit back and and, and just follow me. As an audience this morning, you're going to be rather like um, those of us who are being driven by John across some of the more difficult mountains of New Mexico yesterday. We just had to sit back and uh, trust that we were safely heading towards some kind of coherent destination. This lecture is going to be a bit like that. Anyway, I want to start with uh, an obscure fact about the famous German philosopher Immanuel Kant. One of the lesser known facts about Kant is that his doctoral certificate, dated 1755, bears at the top the unmistakable Arabic words, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. These words, which are, of course, the first verse of the Holy Quran. Now, who on earth could have scribbled these in and for what obscure purpose is uh, a teasing little problem that has um, occupied the leisure time of, of intellectual historians for, for many years. Did the anonymous graffiti artist, who knows perhaps even Kant himself, intend to suggest that there was any kind of congruence between his um, proto-idealistic philosophy and the teachings of the Arabian prophet? Um, or is the gesture, as is more usually held, some kind of ironic joke which upholds philosophy as necessarily the polar opposite of revelation? Well, probably we'll never know. We don't know who put that, those words in and for what reason. But for our purposes today, the question is surely quite a teasing one. If God has defined reality in the Quran, with the hadith providing, as it were, an apparatus of detailed footnotes, what use could anybody have for reason? After all, if God had intended and created the reason in order to penetrate the ultimate secrets of existence and, and the heavens and the earth, he wouldn't probably have bothered to provide revelation in the first place. But more simply, can there be an Islamic philosophy or an Islamic philosophical theology? Or does the mind exist simply to work out some of the marginal entailments of the revealed law, with the heart given the job of assenting to the revelation and thus of knowing God? Well, there are a lot of Muslims, particularly today, who would find the presence of uh, the Quranic words on Kant's certificate particularly horrifying. After all, Kant was the one who made Hegel possible, the man who floated these great metaphysical balloons to fill the spaces left by receding theology. And the job of philosophy in the 20th century basically has been to pop those balloons, leaving us, in most cases, with, with not very much. Now, this anti-philosophical judgment would be shared, interestingly enough, by mystics and by textual literalists alike. The book and the heart propose uh, an epistemology, a means of acquiring knowledge that is guaranteed by Almighty God. The mind, however, seems to be too governed by its conditions and its training in space and time and by the ego to be reliable. After all, the Quran itself begins by recounting how an angel fell from grace by using his mind to defy God. Refusing to bow before Adam, the angel who later became Satan, said, I am better than him. You have created me from fire and created him from mere clay. So the very 
existence of the principle of evil in the world, this Quranic text seems to be suggesting, comes from the use or the abuse of the intellect. Um, it's an interesting um, comparison, incidentally, that the, the Bible starts out with the narrative of the physical creation of the world, whereas the Quran, if you set aside the preliminary first chapter, which is essentially a kind of introductory prayer, the second chapter of the Quran begins with the narrative of the, the creation of the human soul and the, the human being. It's in the first 30 or 40 verses of, of, of the second chapter, if you want to, to check it out. And this view has been quite widespread. You can't really use reason to determine ultimate truths. Um, for instance, there's a very famous uh, Syrian theologian um, following the literalist Hanbali school of law called Ibn Qudama. He died in 1223. Very representative of this literalist tendency. And he wrote a whole book called The Censure of Dialectical Theology which was all about how wicked and blasphemous it is to use the mind in order to attempt to penetrate the, the divine secrets. So he says, um, we must renounce the evilness of theology as shown in its condemnation by our religious leaders who are universally agreed that its advocates are partisans of heretical innovations and abominable error. Good piece of medieval rhetoric there, but fairly characteristic of a certain type of literalist polemic against any use of reason in, in in religious discourse. That kind of attitude was fairly common amongst the ulama, the religious scholars. And we can cl clearly see that it was even more common amongst the pretty non-intellectual masses. God and his prophet didn't use philosophy, so how can we have the temerity to do so? So perhaps we should acquiesce in the polemical Muslim position that you often hear in sessions of dialogue, for instance, that blames the modern world, seen as godless hubris, on a readiness to follow the mind that grew from medieval Christian intellectualism. One of the big contrasts between the intellectual history of Christianity and that of Islam is that in Christianity, the crown of the intellectual disciplines was always theology. That was the central Christian intellectual concern. Whereas in Islam, although there was, as I'll go on to explain, forms of, of sophisticated theology. Nonetheless, their existence was always somewhat marginal. They were taught and continue to be taught in the great orthodox faculties of learning. But the principal Muslim intellectual endeavor has traditionally been mysticism rather than theology. So in classical Christianity, again, these are huge generalizations, but um, in this context, we have to um, rely on them. In classical Christianity, theology is at the center of our struggle to know God. In classical Islam, mysticism is at the center, and the sheer volume of the literature generated by each tradition uh, bears this out. So to get back to this, this polemical point that you'll sometimes hear, you'll find a lot of Muslims today contemplating the lack of intellectual moorings of, of modernity, or what we nowadays term post-modernity, and hurt also by the paradox of the brazen triumph of modernity point to the huge intellectual energy which Christians traditionally invested in philosophical theology as the clue to the emergence of that enlightenment rationalism which ultimately left, let the Greek genie out of, out of the bottle. It was the Christians, according to this view, that released the genie. The Muslims always kept it corked up. So the Muslims were the wise ones who rejected the, the excessive use of pure reason following either the scriptures or the delights of mystical speculation, or quite frequently, both put together. Now, obviously, you don't need to know too much about medieval Christian intellectual history to realize that this polemic actually misrepresents the classical Christian um, scholastic position. It is true that they relied on the intellect, but their definition of the term intellect was quite different to the one we use today. Um, for them, ratio, the use of ratiocination, um, dialectics, um, taking place in, in the mind was a path principally to the articulation and not to the discovery of truth. The truth for the Christian scholastics uh, was located in the thing that they called the intellect, which unlike our modern definition actually included several other phenomena, notably the intuitive divinely um, inspired capacity to, to, to discover truth, providential intuition as part of the faculty of intellect. Nowadays, we exclude it. 
So we find, for instance, in Dante, um, he tells Beatrice towards the close of the Divine Comedy, now do I see that never may the intellect be sated unless that truth do shine upon it. Um, so philosophy in medieval Christendom was famously the handmaid of theology. There were some who tried to promote it beyond its ability. Um, the medieval Averroists, particularly of, of Padua, um, were those who thought that if revelation and reason collide, then reason has to be given, given prior, priority. A number of Averroists, such as uh, Seeger of Brabant, great um, medieval Christian theology, the theologian, were actually smacked down for doing this. And interestingly, the Averroism that they were bringing in came from the Islamic world. Um, Averroes was, of course, Ibn Rushd, the famous philosopher and Maliki jurist of Cordoba. Anyway, so what I'm saying is that this traditional Muslim critique actually misunderstands what the, the scholastics were doing. Um, but it does reciprocate in quite an interesting way the, the mirror image of this, which was the classical or early modern Christian repudiation or interrogation of Islamic reason. Um, we're told uh, particularly by 19th century Orientalists, such as Renan, Ernest Renan, one of the great intellectuals of, of 19th century France, and also by a number of um, Orientalists in the present century, that Islam cannot foster a reason-based theology because Islam emphasizes practice and not thought. The very word Islam itself, these people would tell us, implies a kind of blind, unthinking submission to the inscrutable will of God. And what the religious uh, leaders require is not orthodoxy so much as orthopraxy. In other words, practicing in the right way, not believing in the right way. Orthodoxy in Islam being limited to assent to a very few elementary propositions, perhaps even just the two propositions enshrined in the Shahada itself. Now, this traditional European assumption is, I think, that Islam is a kind of regrettable lapse into Judaic formalism. And it has a, a Judaic type of God who is so transcendent that the mind simply cannot reach him. And hence, um, this kind of religion is suited to less intellectually gifted people, desert dwellers for whom the image is that the sky is very clearly distinguished from the earth. The triune Christian God is an intellectual stimulus and a challenge, whereas Allah or Yahweh is unknowable. And hence, all his devotees can do is to busy themselves with discussing the laws in some kind of casuistic or even pharisaic fashion. So we have a kind of double smugness in recent um, debate between Islam and, and Christendom. Some Muslims and some Christians purveying the image of a uniformly non-intellectualist Islam. However, recent scholarship, very thankfully, has managed to overturn this image. Um, and this overturning has come about in two ways. Firstly, we have, thanks to uh, research in the archives, a growing realization that medieval Muslims did, in fact, do a lot of genuine and profound theologizing, but that given the way in which knowledge was ordered in classical Islamic civilization, this theology doesn't always appear where a Westerner would expect to find it. So books on theology might be quite small, creedal statements, but in fact you find a lot of what Christians would uh, regard as theological issues discussed, for instance, in books on jurisprudence. Um, the preliminary chapters on Islamic jurisprudence often contain issues on what is the nature of man, who is actually required to follow the law, who has a soul, who doesn't, and so forth. Similarly, of course, a lot of uh, theological discussion took place in the, the flourishing traditions of Islamic mysticism. Um, secondly, uh, there has been a lot of research being done into Islamic formal theology itself, which goes under the name of kalam. This is one of the key technical terms in Islamic studies. Kalam. K-A-L-A-M, uh, which simply means speech. And it became applied to theology because one of the early discussions that the Kalam theologians were interested in was the question of God's speech, i.e. the Quran. Is it created in time or has it always existed? So Kalam means systematic theology, rationalizing theology. And we know that Classical Islamic thought did not so much make war on the Greeks as enlist at least some of them as allies. 
Um, so this medieval kalam tradition is not just some kind of scripturalist piety, platitudes, um, rephrasing the, the truths of, of scripture, but actually builds, in many cases, a very sophisticated and internally coherent metaphysical superstructure, um, which in many ways operates in a kind of register that's not too far from that of medieval Christian scholasticism. Um, now, I'll be talking about both of these traditions today, the kalam, i.e. the theological dimension of Islam, and mysticism in due course. But before I can do this and get onto the, the, the real subject of, of today's lecture, which is namely these two areas of iman and ihsan, mentioned in the hadith of Gabriel, I want to backtrack a little bit historically and investigate and retell the narrative of the early Muslim community, because Islamic theology like Christian theology, is something that can only be understood in terms of its historical background and the processes which, which brought it about. Um, remember that right at the beginning of Islam, there was no systematic theology and there was no uh, systematic mysticism in the forms that, that later became normative in Islam. Um, this famous hadith of Gabriel, which I passed around um, in my first lecture, does allude to the legitimacy of levels that transcend the pure outward forms of Islam, that which Renan and his friends would consider to be normative Islam, orthopraxy, the five pillars, etc. Because the hadith of Gabriel, which is unanimously accepted as canonical by the Muslims, explains explicitly that there are higher dimensions. There is the level of iman, which means confident, faithful trust in the existence and goodness of God, and ihsan, which means excellence, explicitly defined in this hadith as meaning spiritual excellence. Now these things obviously exist concentrically, both in individuals and in society. <coughs> and the hadith makes this quite clear. <coughs> it's easy to practice the outward rituals of a religion. You can be a very stupid person or a very bad person and still practice Islam well. You can pray five times a day, fast, etc. So you can exist in this realm. However, a smaller number of human beings are able to move up to the second area of Iman and actually internalize the meanings of these outward practices so that they become true believers and do it sincerely for God. Of those people, again, a smaller minority will be called to the level of Ihsan, which leads to sainthood itself, the ultimate goal of religious practice in all religions selflessness and absolute goodness and living joyously in the presence of, of God. So these three things exist concentrically. Um, now you may remember that I pointed out that in fact less than 10% of the Quran is concerned with those things that we were put in the outward, out, outermost of these circles, the area of, of Islam. In fact, some people say that only about 80 or 90 of the verses of the Quran, which are um, about 6,500 altogether, are actually to do with do's and don'ts, which is a good antidote to those who would regard the Quran as primarily a legalistic document. Um, in fact, we find a lot more about these higher areas. Iman, in particular, is, is constantly referred to in the, in the Quran. And there are also many mystical allusions. So one of the interesting things about classical Islamic literature is that you will find more, a higher percentage of Quranic allusions in doctrinal and particularly in classical mystical texts than you will find in the, uh, the texts that are simply about practice and law. <coughs> 